at AIA Australia. We're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards. Like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, contact your AIA CDM today. Uh, Great to be with you. We got... Oh, got a couple of guys. Hey, Leon, Reese. just opening up now. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Welcome, Erin. Great to have you with us today. Thank you. Great to be um, here. So today we've got Erin Truscott, and uh, she's, she's from GCA Financial based out of Brisbane. Erin's uh, going to be sharing uh, with us a bit about what she's been doing in her business. Erin's um, background is in uh, practice development where she was for about eight years before stepping into advice and uh, she was the winner of the AFA's Rising Star Award last year. So I think it's pretty fair to say that she's navigated that, that change pretty successfully. Um, firstly, I just want to say a big thank you to uh, our partners for these events, AIA, uh, and their support for, for making this sort of stuff happen. So. Thanks to uh, Mel Crawford and the team. Um, and just a reminder for everyone watching in, uh, if you're not already involved in the Facebook group, um, jump online and, and check it out. Uh, our legend Jackie has just shared the link in the chat box there. Um, and it'd be great to get you involved. There's a bunch of great advisors in there sharing ideas. And uh, for anyone in Sydney as well, we've got our event coming up beyond the SOA uh, next Thursday. Uh, so if you haven't got tickets already, you can check them out. We'll put up the link in a second. Um, just for everyone watching in as well, as we go through the session, we've got a few questions to ask Aaron today, um, but there's a chat box there. You can just hit the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you've got any questions as we're going through, feel free to type them into the, to the chat box and, uh, and we're going to come to, to questions at the end. Uh, and yeah, we, we, we'd love to, to hear from you guys and, and hear what you want to know from Aaron as well. So welcome, Aaron. Great to have you here. Thanks. Thanks for, uh, for, for joining us today. Um, I suppose to get things started, can you just give us a, a bit of your background and, uh, you know, how you got into advice, what your business looks like and what sort of advice you provide? Yeah, sure. So uh, my background is uh, it basically started in business development and then moving to uh, practice development. Um, so start on the investment side and then move to more the uh, business development side. So looking after, you know, growth and strategy style stuff with financial advisors, uh, with the licensee that I'm now an advisor under. Um, and through that uh, relationship building uh, with those practices, it sort of became very clear to me about, um, I guess, the the value that you, you can provide as an advisor to your clients and, um, just how special that, that really is. So I sort of got this hunger for it about sort of 12 months into to being a practice development manager and, and then it was sort of about learning as much as I could and uh, luckily I was working with a practice, um, GCA Financial, uh, which is now um, the, the place I call home for the rest of my career uh, and they had an opportunity to come up for a new advisor um, and then um, one year later I became a shareholder in that practice so I guess for me it's been more around um, seeing the value of what, what I could be doing next um, and then taking that leap uh, in with a business who I have really great mentors uh, in which is awesome so yeah the business strategy and development stuff is great and helps you in dealing with people but I've been really lucky to get into a practice that now helps me um, you know, develop on the advice side as well. Um, and also I've been able to help them develop in a lot of areas as well. So it's been a really great, uh, a great fit. Yeah, cool. And so so it's three advisor partners, including yourself, yeah? No, so four, four advisor partners. Uh, three of us are client-facing. Um, the other partner in the business is um, operational um, and sort of compliance and technical technically focused. So... Um, he's kind of the um, nothing gets in or out um, without having that really big check on quality control um, to make sure that we're always meeting all the, the criteria that we need to meet. Um, and that's a really valuable thing to have, have in a business. And I think um, we're probably one of only a few that 
that have that, um, but we're really blessed to have it because, you know, we get so busy. So it's nice to have, have that, that extra check for, for quality um, as we go. Sure. Okay. And cool. And you've got about, I think you've mentioned about 700 active clients. Is that correct? And what, and what do your clients typically look like? Yeah. So um, across the four of us, um, Andy, who I talked about, does do some advice, um, but it's kind of on a, a set sort of level of client. So he's not sort of bringing in um, new new clients or anything like that. So across the business, we'd have about 700. Um we typically look after a uh, small business um, in that professional um, sort of uh, area. So we've got lots of small business as well as the then then looking after their family stuff um, and also their children's stuff. So um, we've got lots of intergenerational advice um, as well within the business where we've helped um, grandparents, parents and children. Um, we've got a really long heritage. It's about uh, 40, going on 44 years soon. Um, so it's typically um, they've come to us for one thing and we'll end up looking after their business and their personal stuff and then as the kids grow up and things like that, we'll take that on as well. Okay, cool. So, yeah, we're, and we're going to talk a bit more about the model for, for the younger clients too. But uh, from, uh, you know, we obviously toured around recently on the, the AFA tour and, and got to chatting and I understand that in your business, you guys, since you, since you joined the business, have implemented a lot of change. Can you tell us a bit about the framework that you use in your business for um, how you actually go about that? Uh, yeah, so I think probably the biggest thing was um, just to probably set the scene a little bit because whilst I was going around the States talking to other advisors, it seemed that um, that was probably one of the biggest things that they connected to. It was if they'd been in a business for a long time or they'd joined a business where... Um, they've had advisors that have, as partners that have been around for a long time, that, that was often the biggest struggle was getting them to, um, you know, want to, to make some positive change. And I think in my case, that was definitely true. We had a business that was pretty, uh, going along pretty well. Um, it, it is, you know, fairly profitable. And I think um, for the guys, it was kind of, for me coming in as a new partner, it was then that big dramatic change where, A, we had kind of another mouth to feed, um, I guess. Um, and B, uh, the way we've always, the way we've been doing things before necessarily isn't going to be uh, the way that we take it forward. So uh, the first thing I'd say is that it wasn't easy. Um, I had to come up with a way to get each of my three business partners um, and more importantly, the staff in the business um, to want to come along because People are so set, in, you know, in their ways and um, in comes this ball at a gate, you know, trying to make all this this crazy change really quickly. So the first step was around just getting everyone on board and trying to dig deep, deep into what's important to them so that I could understand where I could sort of drive them to, to make them want to make the change. And then from there it was about going, okay, what are the, the big things we need to change? So for us it was about um, capacity. We have... Lots of bums on seats, uh, or enough bums on seats, I guess, and but yet we still seem to be chasing our our tail. So for me, it was kind of finding a way to say, well, if we're going to be able to grow, how do we grow if we can't? If we seem to be chasing our tail on the existing businesses, so the first part of the framework was really pulling apart, you know, um, the the machine, the the business as a machine. So how do we do things? Um, why do we do things and I think you know I talked about this as being another big thing that, that we always got back to was why do we do things is because the way we've always done it um, and you know everyone's got that issue I think in their business where they sort of question things and then don't don't really know why why they do it so it was about sitting down as a group collectively um, not just as partners but with everyone and just pulling apart that process so it's a tedious exercise but going through step by step what we do and why we do it um, and the why is such an important part because often you don't, sometimes you get to things and you don't know why. Um, so that's where we go, okay, cool. Well, then if we don't know why, well, let's figure that out and sort of piece it back together in a way that's going to be more efficient um, and it allows us to have more capacity so that we can take on, on new clients and help 
more people because for me that's what it's about being able to help as many people as possible and if we can do that then the rest will just follow um i believe so um that was probably the biggest uh, part of it and it was about making the time um to work on the business um as opposed to to just trying to to grow it before we had the capacity to um to do it properly if that if that makes, yep. makes sense yeah yeah it does. And look, I, I think that's a, a struggle that, it, that everybody has that, you know, making time to work on their business. How do you, how do you go about that personally and or do you have a framework for how you do it as a business? Um, with great difficulty. Look, I think it's really interesting. I think you just have to make the time. And I think if you if you can sit and take a look at um, I don't know how many people on the you know on the line are um, ideas people, but I certainly am one of those. And I think you can have a million ideas a day, but if you don't focus on some really great things and do them properly, um, then you can kind of keep starting a whole bunch of things and not um, finishing them. So we've had a, we've got a rule now that I'm only allowed to have three big projects a year, um, and we have to agree on them and work through them and, and sort of smash them out of the park before we continue. Um, you just have to make time. So for us, it was about um, putting in. Um, I've got two block out times in my diary um, twice a week. Um, it's on a it's on a Monday and a Friday. Um, there's there's two reasons for that. It's a sort of getting ready for the week and finishing off the week. Um, but there's also a few hours in those times where it's working on the business um, and not um, not just in it, sort of trying to drive that. Um, you know, and you've just got to put in that sweat equity as well. It's not about um, working from you know nine till five, um, as most people um, would know. But for me, you know, there's a couple of t- couple of days a week where. I've got to sort of sit and make some time at night where I'm in a quiet space, you know, in a nice environment where I can focus on those projects and sort of um, make them come to fruition. And then when you're in the office, you can then get the people involved that need to be involved um, and, and sort of sure. work on it from there. But it's okay. not easy. Yeah. It's just, about, it's just about saying I'm going to commit to the time and making it and, and not letting anything else get in the way of it. I'm curious, Erin, about uh, when you when you unpackaged the business and how things were were going. What, um, where did you find you saved the most time, and sort of what what were you able to do? Was there big time savings that you ended up making in your process, and where were the biggest savings? Yeah, so I think um, the biggest thing we actually uh, identified as the core problem was um, communication across uh, ourselves. So how many people touched a file, who needed to touch a file. Um, we have a, a bit of a weird setup where we're all open plan, but we've actually got sort of admin on one side and then there's a bit of a door to go through the other side. So we found ourselves walking back and forth a lot. So implementing things like um, Skype for business, which most people, you know, have used for a really long time. But for us, it's, you know, instead of getting up and walking across the room now, um, we can just put it in to that and everyone um, can see what's happened in that conversation because it all gets saved. So it's a really good way of sort of storing conversations. I think for us as well, it was um, too many touch points for different people. So we had um, power planner and admin working on application forms when really we only needed to have one side of the business, which is admin working on, on forms. And why do we do it that way? Because we've just always done it that way. So it was kind of going who whose role is what and what is the capability of that role and what should they be doing um and then once we knew what that was you kind of fit those capabilities to the people in those specific roles and i think often we can do that in reverse where we go okay what can you do well here's what so we don't like here's what you'll get so we don't often push people out of their comfort zones so we kind of took took the emotion out of it and went okay we've got you know, two CSOs, we've got one admin, um, and then we've got four advisors and a power planner. What do each of those roles look like in an ideal world? And then how do we then pull that process and give each task to its relevant person um, according to the role that they need to do in the business? So that then freed up time for our power planner. Um, for example, I think he's doing an extra something like three or four ROAs in one SOA a week. Um, to, you know, 
which, which he wasn't doing before because he's now not touching a whole part of the process that he used to just because it's the way we'd, we'd always done it. So I think for us it was about um, the biggest time saver or time creator was um, allowing that time to be freed up, which means we can see more people and get more done um, in a shorter um, amount of time. And that then frees up his time to do extra stuff on the, you know, technical and compliance side um, with, with Andy instead of it being, you know, printing, binding, you know, sorting out fact prof fact fun profiles and things like that, just the little things that are quite simple tasks that um, can be done in a whole other area of the business. So basically sure. time for clients, more time for clients, which is good. Yeah, nice and how did, you, how did you map out, like once you took the time to define your process, how did you actually map that out? Was that, did you use some technology or is it would you, yeah. manual? Yeah. So we have built it into the uh, into OneNote at the moment. Um, it's kind of a work in progress because I don't know whether that's the best place to have it, but at the moment it works really well for us um, because with OneNote you can sort of build it in. Um, for those of you who haven't used it, you can build it in so you've got like little tabs down each side. So each part of our process is literally written so that, um, you know, you if you wanted Nash, you could come in next week and do that CSO or advisor role, um, it's literally that detailed that it's step by step. How do we, from, from opening up the office in the morning to putting together applications step by step to how we print out and present an SOA um, to our advice process. So it's kind of there and if anyone wants to go in, it's just an easy way for us to find things because you click on the relevant advice area and inside there are all all the key sort of things that so you can kind of click through and eventually get to what you need to um, or the, the instructions that you need. Um, we probably aren't, haven't really used a lot of technology in the business up until, um, you know, we're starting to sort of look at all, all that stuff now. But I think there'll probably be a better way. And I'm actually open to suggestions on, on um, how other people have built their process documents because I think there's Lots of different tools out there which we've explored, um, but until we find the right one, that's that's really working for us. It's just about having access to it um, quickly and easily. Um, yep. And it's another time saver because, again, um, people aren't going and asking, you know, knocking on your door all day saying, oh, how do we do that again and how do we do this again? Because it's all there step by step. So if you're unsure, you can go and find it in a couple of clicks instead of, taking someone out of their um, work zone that they're in. Well, Erin, the, sh the short answer to wondering what else is out there is just uh, hop on the Facebook group, uh, XY yeah. Advisor, and um, yeah, yeah, there's already been a couple of discussions in that space, but yeah. um, you throw something out and you'll get an answer. You'll get about 10 options within within a day. Yeah. So um, and Ben's just thrown off Rike there, which I know a couple of people use, and um, his work sorted. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's many, plenty of, yeah. <laughs> it's so many. It's so hard to choose. That's why the group's been so good in terms of going, you just you just let people form a consensus. You go, okay, well, 10 people like that one, so that's the decision made as opposed to yeah. having to yeah. navigate everything yourself. So it's, yeah. it's been giving you a bit of efficiency. I think the other thing I'll just touch on is with the process is we've implemented a... Um, little system where if someone wants to change a process, so we've all agreed on it collectively, if someone wants to change it, it only happens in our team meeting, which happens on a Monday. We deal with it there, we discuss it there, and then the document's living and breathing. So um, the admin team have access to it, they can go and update it. So it's not a set and forget, it's, it's literally updated every time we can find something or a better way to do things. So I think, um, and I encourage the team to do that. If you think that there's something better we can do or a better way we can do things, um, let's talk about it. The process doesn't have to be the process and it could change, you know, once a month, just a little tweak somewhere. Um, but it's living and breathing and it allows for that efficiency to grow and be better um, as new technology or, or ways of doing things sort of come to, to light. Yeah. Yeah, yeah look, that sounds like a great approach and I think it's, it's obviously important to constantly... Um, sort of iterate there. I, I just put up a link to Rike, which is a software that we use in our business, which is super helpful for, for mapping yeah. processes and, and uh, in step by step you can add in YouTube clips and um, pro, you know process process map all your steps. Um, I, I just before I turn it over to to Adrian to ask a, a couple more questions, I just want to talk a bit about the um, work because I know that you've sort of 
been pushing more since you joined into the business in uh, working with the, in the uh, younger client space. So I'm keen to just discuss, you know, how you approach that and, and what sort of uh, what sort of things you're doing in that space to, to work with the, the Gen Y and the younger clients? Yeah. Um, I think the answer to the, the end outcomes can often be not too, you know, dissimilar. So you, you get to the same kind of things but just in a different way. So what I'm finding um, with the younger generation is that they're just less interested. Um, it's different. Oh, God, it's so hard because sometimes you get them coming in and they're, they've been picking their own stocks and doing all this really funky stuff. But most of them just want a plan and a strategy and they're not thinking about superannuation. They don't really know too much about insurance. Most of them, you know, most people that I start with that haven't had um, anything to do with, with an advisor will talk about, oh, yeah, I've got insurance for my car, for my house, you know, for all that sort of stuff, for my phone. Um, but they kind of don't have a good grasp on, you know, protecting their own um, income or, you know, fending for them, they're helping their family if they were sick or any of that sort of stuff. So we, we're very whiteboard eccentric um, and we basically map out the journey um, on a whiteboard, focusing on the earlier years. So we focus on short-term goals with a long-term um, end outcome. We talk about financial freedom, which is working because you want to, not because you have to. So superannuation is a really dirty word um, in our business because it sounds sucky. It just, it's not interesting. It's really boring. Young people don't like it. They don't understand a lot about it until you go through that sort of education process. We liken it to, um, you know, we talk about how much money they save. We ask them, you know, we tell them that they're saving 9.5% a year and they're like, what are you talking about, you know, and then that's sort of yeah. what stuff. Then get them excited about, oh, okay, that actually is my money and I do have a say in, in what happens with it. Um, and we've got this thing, it's called a, a Grow, Protect, Prosper roadmap. So it's kind of just a one page, it's sort of you split the screen into four, four, spot, four spots. And we really focus on the first box first, which is the, um, it's the goal setting, it's letting them dream, it's talking about what's important to them, where they're headed. Um, and if you can generate enough excitement in that, um, that part, which is like most clients, it's just talking about different things because they're at a different stage. Then the mm. other stuff just kind of flows through. Um, and we've just found we've had really great um, success, not only in um, them being really excited when they leave, but they're making really drastic changes quite quickly. I had a young couple that I've been working with and um, the the... The lady was more into, you know, fun, you know, had the finances and managing money and, and being across and in control of things. Um, and he really wasn't, so he actually didn't want to come and see me. It was, like, it was almost like he was a bit embarrassed of his, his own situation. So she came on her own first and then eventually we got him in. And within a month, he's just completely changed. And it was purely just by talking about, you know, well, what is important to you? What do you love? Forget this. It's gonna it's like super's gonna happen later. Or finance, like, but, but let's focus on. Well, how old do you want to be when you want financial freedom? And they're like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. Um, so then it's about building realistic goals around creating financial freedom. Um, still working because you don't stop. You know, a lot of people don't just stop and sit around. Um, they just can have the choice if they want to. So that's probably the biggest focus, and I think a good draw card for thinking about the future um, is it's not when we're going to be stopping and old you know which yeah. is the thought that they get when they hear super and um, they more think about positive goals and driving that towards financial freedom well there's some good there's a really good question from dylan there that we'll, we will jump into shortly um yeah. but while we're on that engagement piece what are like you've talked about um obviously that that grow um that template grow. that you use yeah, what, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Um, are there any other ways that you engage that generation and get them sort of uh, like is there in terms of and we can ex extend this to like social media for example or yeah. other other channels that you're using to get them involved and excited yeah about so, it? social media um, is just about to start for us so we're probably a little bit behind on that eight ball um, just purely because 
you know, of the long heritage of the business. And, and I think, um, you know, you talk to, to Tim, Gary and, and Andy and they're like, oh, we don't really know, know or understand sort of how we make that work. And so um, we've sort of done a lot of, um, you know, work around where we're going to start. So we're just sort of starting to dip our toe in the water on that, that side. But one of the big things we've just created was um, a, a series of client videos and the client videos are based around um, individual clients that tell their story about what they do in their businesses. And we've done it across lots of different types of um, demographics um, from, you know, the young entrepreneur right through to the intergenerational family who are farmers and have passed down to the, the kids. We've got a young um, cyclist and she, you know, she's told her story. So it's all about them in their own environments. It's got nothing to do with what GCA did for them or um, the great work that we did. It's more their success through their own story um, and in their own business and, and in, in the life that they've created for themselves. And um, that's a really good marketing tool for us because depending on who's looking, they'll find the one that's most relevant to them. So they can connect to a story um, instead of connecting to a process um, and that's been a really valuable uh, exercise for us. And as we start to dip our toe into the, the social media um, waters, um, a lot of those will get used because we'll continue to do a couple of those a year. So we'll start to use those to sort of, I guess, um, you know, on a one-to-many approach. Um, and that's where I see the value of, of social media is being able to educate, um, you know, the masses Um you might not be able to get every one of them in front of you, but there's certainly a lot of work that we can do to give back and, and make sure that people are at least furthering their financial literacy and um, understand um, what's important to them. Um, yeah, so we haven't, yeah, we're a bit behind on that one, but we're getting there, we're getting there. Yeah. That's all right. Um, and if anyone hasn't seen those videos that Erin put together, they are, Amazing. Um, I'm just popping the link to uh, to her website in the in the chat box here and jump on and check them out. Erin's um, used a, a company based out of Brisbane. Um, which what was the what was the company that you guys used, Erin? Uh, Little Tokyo. Which, which Little one? Tokyo. So um, um, yeah, amazing and and hearing the the client stories, but with you know super high production values. It's uh, they've they've come out really well, and I think tell the story quite well. Um, I'm just keen, before I, I pass it over to Patty, and um, for anyone watching in as well, if you guys have got any questions, we're going to get super, uh, questions from the group in a sec, so feel free to type them into the chat box uh, on the side there. But um, I just wanted to finish off with like how you um, approach working with these younger clients, Like, given that you, your business probably had more focus on uh, the, the older generations. What have you found like were the biggest learnings for you in in going down that path? Um, I think at the start um, and being sort of relatively fresh, um, you know, you understand that the advice process but actually putting that into to practicality um, can be, um, you know, pretty hard at the start as you sort of find your feet. I think... Um, a couple of the young ones we might have worked or I might have worked with at the start, I probably wasn't engaging them in the right way in terms of, you know, really sitting back and going, well, what are they going to want to get out of this? Because um, you instantly revert to the, yeah, again, the way we've always done things, so that, that process. So um, it was just about taking a completely fresh approach and saying, what are they going to want what are they going to want? And, and I'm one of them. So what do I want? Like what 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 do I find exciting? And, um, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about um, financial advice is, is that um, people don't really find it exciting if they've never done it um, or they've never engaged with someone where they've been able to have a really great conversation. So I think just learning to sort of get on, on their level and, and having that empathy and, you know, being able to put yourself in their shoes um, and quickly get around... Um, where they're wanting to, to head um, and do it as if you were them, um, I guess. So um, I, had a, I had a couple that, um, you know, probably fell off the perch, um, you know, because I followed a process instead of, you know, mixing that up uh, a bit. Um, 
The biggest learning, the biggest, the second biggest learning, and, and this is a positive one, is that um, like most businesses, we have a massive opportunity um, in our business to work with clients' children. Um, and, you know, so it was about me going, instead of sort of going out and, you know, hunting for, for new ones, we've done a bit of a mix of both, but um, why not get them from the people that we've worked with for years um, that know what the value is, um, that are now living that, you know, dream of financial freedom um, and have those young children and so they're our biggest advocates. So I think it's about um, not making it too hard for yourself and, and identifying where the opportunities are from, from within uh, the business as well. Um, I think the other thing that I did that had really big success was working within different communities. So I got involved with a... Um, a group called um, It Starts With Us and the lady that runs it is a teacher and she just started running these events for women who were mums um, or mums and working um, but they were feeling pretty lonely and uninspired and sort of in their roles so they would, would get together and she'd run these really cool uplifting style events um, for women and um, just getting out and speaking on really simple terms like educating people around um, you know, for, for in this particular instance, it was, you know, women being mums, stopping work, what that means, some of the little tweaks you can make, you know, to make a really big difference in your future. And those are sort of the long burning um, ones. But but over time, um, I've probably had about 10, 10 of those women from that group come and see me with their husbands and young families to get advice when a trigger has happened in their brain where they've said, oh, I remember, and Erin talked about that on that day, so they've made contact um, with with the office. So I think the other big learning is just to give time and give back um, because, again, that one-to-many approach um, can be really valuable for them but also valuable for you uh, as a business. So one okay. hour of time can create, you know, 10, in this case, new, new ongoing service, um, you know, in it for the long journey, clients with us. Well, I know, um, yeah, Ben's, Ben's had some great success doing workshops and getting out on the um, yeah. sort of one-to-many format in that, that sense. Uh, the, the, the angle, of, I'm going to get into Dylan's question here because it's sort of, uh, um, there's a lot of practices out there that are either working off um, a book um, of clients that's come from somewhere or they're, they're in your position where they're a younger advisor that's come into a large um, a, a practice that's been around for a while. Um, Dylan wants to know how you've been managing um, that sort of, uh, I guess, around focusing on the younger clients, but how do you sort of reconcile that with the 50, 55 to 75 age bracket, the older generation that come with that existing client base? Uh, this is a good one. Um, so this is a hard one for me to answer because I think... I've probably got a bit of a different structure than a lot of other businesses. Um, we don't have our own books. We have shareholding um, in the practice. So, um, and you're a client of GCA, so um, which works really well. So, yeah, although I've sort of taken on some of those, they generally predominantly do work with the, the appropriate, um, you know, demographic because we've got those advisors through the ages. So we've got 70, you know, 45, um, 35 and then me at 32. So, um, yeah, that's, it is tough. I don't, I, I've sort of tended to look after after the, the younger ones more so. Um, so, sorry, tell me, ask me that question again so I can just... So I, I guess it's more like, an, and Dylan can jump in and elaborate a bit more, but I'm getting the impression that he's talking about just the um, requirement to sort of have to deal with both um, demographics and yeah. how how to adjust. If you're, you've set yourself up to sort of focus on the younger yeah. people, all of yes. a sudden you get someone that just pops yeah. in and they're, they're 55 plus, does it get passed on to the, the um, older advisors yeah. in the practice? Yeah. Or do you still deal with them, and how do you how do you adjust for yeah. that? So, if for for example, a center of influence that we work with has referred a client, referred it specifically to me, then yes, absolutely. You know, you want to work with them, and I think. Uh, sorry, was it Dylan? Was it Dylan? Yeah, yeah. Um, Dylan, I think um, it goes back to or the way that I approach that is. Um, 
with empathy. And I don't know, um, everyone sort of has a different different little definition for empathy, but it really is about putting yourself in, in their shoes. So I think it doesn't really matter how old the clients are. If you can take that approach and, and think about that at the end of the day, um, a lot of the strategies that you do for people can often be not too dissimilar. It's just using their own life, um, but they're going to need things like structuring for their um, superannuation investments. They're going to then need to protect that. They're going to want to set some goals. You're going to want to track to those. And there might be things along the way that you want to sort of take into account. So it's more just connecting with them at their level and, and thinking about um, they are who they are and trying to connect with them. And the first few minutes to think, okay, what if what would I do if I was in their shoes? What would I want? How would I be feeling? And if you can connect on that level, then you can kind of get there, I think. Um, well, Dylan's, Dylan's just jumped in and sort of um, drawn it back to the, the marketing. Um, so, yeah, so um, in terms of, I guess, if, if you're playing around with a, a practice's branding um, to link it more and the messaging you're putting out there to younger generation, is yeah. there an issue? Have you noticed any issues with um, the older generation relating to it and things like that? Yeah. Um, the short answer is no. Um, but I do get that because it was a big concern that we had um, at the outset. I think um, yeah, our process that we go on with clients is, is the journey and that basically starts as soon as you start, you know, earning money, wanting to know what to do with it. And that can happen, you know, from when we're 14 years old. So obviously we're not seeing clients when they're 14, but um, it's it's about that. So for our older clients, I think for them, um, I don't know, we haven't really noticed an issue because I think they just understand that who we are, what we do, and if they know the process um, is the journey from the time you start right through to the time you end, then, of course, we need to market um in different ways to different demographics. I think if you've got some good reporting, um, like ways to report, you can kind of focus different marketing to the different group age groups. Um, but also one benefit of, to us of marketing towards the younger demographic to our entire client base is that, again, it's helped those older clients go, oh, I've got kids. That's exactly what they're worried about at the moment. Um, so, you know, it's allowed us to then get, communicating with um, clients that might not be getting those marketing um, or getting that marketing because they're not on, you know, they're not on our list yet, but, but their parents are. So, yeah, no, I haven't really had an issue, but I'm happy if, I mean, if you've had a specific instance that, um, you know, you've had that you wanted to, to elaborate on, I'm more than happy to, to sort of work through that. Yeah, Dylan still has just said that, um, yeah, they haven't had pullback either. Um yeah, just focusing on like a, a robust advice process in general that sort of deals with yeah. any type of client that comes in. Yeah. Um, just to be the go. Aaron, yeah. just to jump in on, I wondered like, how do you find it with working with, you working with younger clients, older clients and business owner clients as well? How do you find the, like in terms of a driving, because obviously you're big on efficiencies, but how do you manage the, you know, doing things efficiently and having that process that you talked about, but then having clients that might look quite different. Yeah, so I think, um, and you, they do, they do come up um, a lot um, where, yeah, you've got to kind of take, uh, again, like it's, it's just kind of stepping into each of their shoes. But I think for us, the beauty that we have is the, the four of us inside the business are really um, different in terms of our skill sets and things like that. So we do have, and I know everyone doesn't have this, um, but for those that do, um, like never be afraid to get someone else um, involved. If you think that something's a bit different or that you think that they're, they might connect with a different person. Um, now, it's different when you're running your own book. I do understand that because there's a bit more of a, um, you know, own your own client base and, and sort of drive your own revenue. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we just need to um, – we get, get everyone involved. I mean, if, if something's different um, or they're different or they've got a different need that's a bit weird and, and wonderful, which often you, you can get, it's just about connecting them with the right person um, 
in the business. Um, and if we need to do it as a joint, then we do it as a joint. For those that don't have that, um, yeah, it's a tough one, but I think you've just got to sort of go away. Like not, not everyone wants the answers straight away. So it's about then going, I'm just going to take a step back from that, that specific person or situation or scenario, um, and then go away and sort of figure it out and, and come back to them. Um, if it's a personality thing, um, I think for those of you on the uh, that were on the road show, if it's a personality thing, it ain't going to work. I mean, some people just hate your guts. They just do. They don't think you're valuable and they're not, not going to um, want to go along with you. So in that instance, you kind of like, if you're this much trouble now, you know, there's no point. Um, so a big learning from me because I tried to hang on to quite a few of these in my early days of it. Well, I'm still in my early days, but the very early days. Um, and they're just, they just turn out to be nightmares. So um, learn how to cut and run um, when you know inside that they're just not going to be a good fit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's stage, stage of life. Yeah. <laughs> Ray, Ray mentioned um, he's... Uh, He's interested in the one to many, and he just he's he's asking if you thought about like uh, doing it from a revenue standpoint. Uh, I know Ben would have something to say about that because he charges for his workshops. Have you is that something you've considered? Um, I haven't as yet, um, and I think it'll be something sort of yeah down the track that that um, I have thought about. I think um, at the outset, it's more people that have asked me to come along and do things and, and sort of contribute in that way. So I guess after you do a few and you realise just how valuable it can be, um, you know, for the people that are, that are there in that particular audience, um, if you position it towards the audience you're speaking to, then, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, it's your time, right, and you're giving people some really valuable uh, things to think about and good takeaways. So um, they might go away and do a few of those things that you've talked about that day um, just from a general perspective, like just at least take a look at their cash flow or check out, you know, do the super consolidation or, you know, those little things that people let go on for years and years and years that they, they've never really understood or know about. So um, I think from a workshop perspective, I've never really run it workshop style. It's more just been speaking um you know, to a particular audience and doing Q&A and things like that. Um, but there's absolute value in it. Um, and I think, you know, the more that we continue to do in the business, um, you know, we'll have to because it is time out of the day. Um, there's also the other side of that argument that you go, though, oh, this, you, you can get a lot out of it. Um, so the sort of return comes, you know, from the giving back. So you've just got to put that, I think it's a fine line. Yeah, great. Well, that's... Um... Yeah, I, I'd suggest you have a chat to Benny offline um, yeah, yeah. about uh, how right. his experience. He's like down. <laughs> he's because yeah. um, it's been working really well, from my understanding. Um, we've, we've we've taken up um, everyone's time, and I hope everyone's gotten something great out of this. We thank Erin for sharing um, her experience and some of the things she's doing in her practice, um, and uh, yeah, some great takeouts from that. Um, we might just drop in uh, Jack if you want to just let everyone know. Um, we've got next week's sorted, uh, our event, um, and the next webinar. So um, we've got Jade Elay. So Jade's, uh, Jade's a young advisor. He's taken over a large practice, and um, he's, he's taken on a couple of um, people over in the Philippines, and he's had a great experience um, in doing that, and he's just I know he's just recently added on another person. He's been over there, so really good um, insight into how that's, how that's done, what it's like, um, whether it's worth it. So everyone tune in for that. And again, hair to everyone in Sydney. Hair. What's that, Aaron? Good hair. Best haircut in the industry. He's got, he's got some good hair. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, he does have great hair. <laughs> it's almost as good as Ben's beard. Um, <laughs> The other thing is, um, yeah, everyone in Sydney, the events are next week. There's still a couple of spots. So, um, yeah, we'd love to have you there. It's always a good few beers to, and catch up with everyone. Um, thanks to AIA. Uh, we can't do this without you. And uh, we're looking forward to um, – if, 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 if anyone has any other questions, post them on Facebook. Erin, I believe, will uh, jump on and, um, and jump answer on. them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. When she gets a chance, Francis, she's, I'm sure she's got some client things to get to, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah she'll have to follow up with her. What's <laughs> up?
I said I've always got time for that. Happy to, um, yeah, share on Facebook, but give anyone my details if they want, you know, to see anything of the things we're, we're doing. So, yeah, absolutely. Awesome, Aaron. That's the, that's the XY spirit. Well, uh, this is from all of us here. Uh, we'll uh, catch you next week and um, enjoy the rest of the, the week. See you guys. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah.